So the topic today is inability of international law to resolve international conflicts. And I wanted to focus on uh, Crimea annexation as sort of a case study um, for today. We're going to start with some legal aspects. And then uh, as you are experts in economics, geopolitics and things of that nature, we're going to talk about the implications of something like this moving forward for the international community. So firstly, does anyone have any idea what is international law? How is it different from domestic law and does it work or not? Does anyone have any views on that before we start? Nobody. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of binding, there are conventions and treaties. And uh, once it's signed by an executive representation of a, of a state and then ratified by the legislative branch, it's supposed to be binding. But we're going to see that, um, yeah, it's not, it's not always the case. Go ahead. It sometimes relies, I think, on the states themselves and their domestic courts to actually apply the law itself. Yeah. Apply the, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it doesn't have a, um, one arbitrator international law, right? And like you have, for example, Supreme Court in the UK, there is nothing like this. There is a court for um, criminal convictions, but that's very different, international criminal court. But so, for example, um, the EU laws are not directly applicable. If it's, for example, an EU directive, it's not directly applicable in the UK. You would have to introduce domestic legislation um, in order to have it legally binding. But usually the states enter into international agreements on international plane, right? So that means that the, um, we hold states to account and states enter international agreements. It is not that every single individual has to sign something or anything like this. So it's, it's a very strange relationship of you know, governments that are in power enter in agreements on behalf of states and the governments change and then all kinds of problems come from that. And this is what we've seen with, um, for example, uh, US pulling out of the Paris Agreement, right? Obama, using his executive power, entered into the Paris Treaty and then Trump overturned it because it wasn't ratified by the US Congress, but th that would be impossible to do. Right, so let's, let's get into the, oh, wrong computer. So I'm from Ukraine originally. Uh, and I just want to apologize for the fact that it seems that the, the West every now and then is looking with awe oh, at uh, Ukrainian democracy or rather our strive to achieve one. Uh, there was Orange Revolution 2004 um, that was successful and then there was a huge disappointment because the living standards fell. There was a lot of corruption and it was more of the old government that we overturned. Uh, then more recently there was the Ukrainian Revolution in, in 2013-2014. Uh, our president decided to change his course and instead of the EU integration that we all wanted, he took 15 billion from Russian government and said that now we're going to Russia and we're going to be partnered with Russia. So Ukrainians went crazy, we overthrew him, he left the country. Uh, and yet again, it's a big disappointment. Our new government is still corrupt and uh, nothing good really came out of it. Who, who, have, who have heard from about the Ukrainian conflict? I'm assuming a lot of people. <coughs> right. I want to just note quickly that there is a decrease in public interest in the Ukraine crisis. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's not really on the news uh, as much as it used to be. You know, BBC was talking about Ukraine all the time. And uh, even though we still have more than 30,000 people killed uh, and um, injured in the war in the East and the South, uh, public interest is, is very low. Uh, and I also wanted to put in the stats for interest in egg, that Instagram egg. And that apparently is much more interesting than Crimea or we're in Ukraine, but that's okay. Right, so um, Putin. This is what he said, I believe, three years ago uh, when the US chose to take the course of actions that they did in Syria. He said, we believe that preserving law and order in today's complex and turbulent world is one of the few ways to keep international relations from sliding into chaos. So he was urging the West to start appreciating and respecting international laws uh, right before he decided to chop off the piece of um, Ukraine for himself. Now, I just want to start with talking about war in general and why it's illegal. Does anyone here think that law should be legalized? Does anyone think it should be illegal to wage war? Go to war to, with another state. Any reasons why? Peace, anyone else? Mm -hmm. Too much to bear. Okay, anyone else? 
Yeah, so, so basically this is it. The, um, the kind of the quest to end war as we know it was uh, initially the purpose of League of Nations. Uh, that was early 20th century. Um, there was a Paris Peace Agreement, also known as kellogg Bryant Pact, which basically outlawed war, right? It says that the international community condemns um, any government or any leader waging war against another state. Uh, and then right after the state signed it, and in the green you can see the states that uh, ratified the agreement, and in light green, I believe those are, no, sorry, in light blue, those are the dependent territories of those states. But then right after it was signed in 1931, uh, there was a Japanese conflict in Manchuria, 1935 in Ethiopia, and in 1939, Russia invaded Finland. So they signed it, outlawed war, and then they all went to war. So it didn't really work um, very well. Now, the difference now, um, you know, there was creation of the United Nations after, after World War II, and there are two reasons, I believe, why we, the international community really decided that war is, is no good um, forever. One is the devastating impact of World War II um, compared to any previous conflict that was a mass murder on the scale that is quite, um, quite striking and, and incredibly upsetting. You can see Poland's lost 17% of its population, Soviet Union lost 14% mostly men, so that is a, th this kind of demographic shock is pretty much unacceptable in the future. That's what the, um, the West thought. And also nuclear weapons, right? Now, the reason why European Union, the US, they don't want escalation of the conflict, right? They always say, we condemn the actions, but we don't want to escalate anything because the next war can be, right, the last war after the nuclear weapons um, came into human possession. You know, we're quite lucky that we haven't blown ourselves up uh, yet, but we understand that there are a few nuclear states. Uh, the next conflict, if it goes to the scale of World War II, um, you know, we potentially can destroy the planet. So now we are very, very focused on not letting another um, wide-scale war, right? And it's, and, it's, and it's justified, I think. So the UN, that was basically the reason for its creation, right? Um, Article 1 says that states should maintain international peace and security, take effective collective measures for prevention and removal of threats to peace, and uh, Article 2.4 of the UN Charter is um, the one that is most often cited in use of force cases. And it's basically the fact that the, any state should be refrained from uh, the use of force or threat of use of force uh, on another state. Also, before we go to the group discussions, one thing is economic integration. And uh, I don't know if you were there yesterday, I asked a question uh, from, I asked, this, I asked this European commissioner, Chris Christos, a question about EU's role as a preserver of peace because it has been quite successful in that. So the economic integration uh, of the European Union was actually largely in order to preserve peace in Europe. European states have long history of going to war. So um, the, the parent of European Union, the uh, economic community of coal and steel, uh, mainly between France and Germany, was really in order to engrave the domestic economies uh, into an integration where it would be very difficult to go to war with each other because of the devastating effects on the economies, right? And we can see similar arguments uh, going on uh, when we're talking about the US and China and their trade war, you know, because China owns a lot of the US debt and then the US owns also Chinese stocks. So going to war with each other is, is simply economically, um, it's not, not very feasible. It's not, it's not a smart economic decision. And uh, this one is, this, this graph is just supposed to illustrate, uh, illustrate the success of uh, the European Union. So we have uh, World War I, World War II. This is the European Economic Community and that's the European Union establishment. You can see that the scale of conflicts are now much smaller than they used to be. So we can say that EU has kind of done its job in terms of preserving peace. Uh, now it's the most peaceful time in history. So congratulations to all of us uh, to be living in it. We can see also the big world wars there in the upper right hand corner. And now we can see violence going down dramatically. So we're living in, in, in good times, unlike what media tries to portray to us. So uh, now let's move on to Crimea. And um, I didn't really rehearse this because I got quite emotional trying to prepare the presentation. So this is the conflict that uh, really means a lot to the geopolitics of Europe, right? It's the first time, arguably after Georgia, where one state uh, in such an aggressive manner an ex territory of another state, and that was really condemned by the whole international community. So I want us to watch a quick video about it, if that's okay with you guys. One sec. It's been a year since Russia annexed Crimea from Ukraine. Although there are similar 
a lot of questions about the Russian government's actions, the big picture is much clearer. Now, Feel free to have the snacks, by the way. Let's take a look at the timeline of events surrounding Crimea's deceptive annexation. Violent anti-government protests sparked the Ukrainian revolution and the ousting of President Viktor Yanukovych. Russian President Vladimir Putin holds a secret meeting about extracting the deposed Yanukovych and annexing Crimea from Ukraine. Heavily armed pro-Russian gunmen occupied a Crimean parliament and allegedly forced an emergency in statement of the new pro-Russian prime minister. The new Crimean prime minister takes control of Ukraine's security forces and officially asks Russia to provide assistance in assuring peace. Russia pledges the use of their armed forces in Ukraine. President Putin tells reporters that the unidentified soldiers occupying Crimean military bases are not Russian and says that Russia will not try to annex Crimea. A planned referendum to accede Crimea to Russia is condemned by the Ukrainian government, the US and the EU. Russia announces massive military exercises along the Ukrainian border. The US Department of State calls this an intimidation attempt in the lead up to the referendum. Officials report that 95.5% of Crimean voters support joining Russia in the referendum, but many residents abstain. No international observation of the vote is allowed. The Crimean parliament officially joins the Russian Federation. US President Barack Obama announces sanctions against Russian and Ukrainian officials. Good times. The G8 votes to oust Russia over the unconstitutional referendum. They become the G7. Additionally, 100 countries support a UN resolution calling the March 16th referendum illegal. Russia accidentally releases documents suggesting the referendum vote may have been falsified. President Vladimir Putin admits that despite originally denying any involvement, the invasion and annexation of Crimea was planned all along. In the years since, a number of hard-hitting sanctions have been imposed on Russia by the United States and their international allies, crippling the Russian economy. In spite of widespread condemnation, Putin has made no concessions regarding Crimea and may have his eye on the rest of Ukraine. To learn more about the conflict between Russia and Ukraine... No, thank you. Right, so this was, you know, in the comments of this YouTube video, there is uh, a lot of dislikes and saying that it's Western propaganda and it, it paints uh, quite a one-sided picture and we're going we're gonna to go back to that. But the timeline was actually as follows. There was a revolution asking the government to go with the European integration. Uh, we've overthrown the government. Um, then there was revolution of dignity, which was uh, an answer from the people to the violence from uh, the police force towards students that were peacefully protesting. And in this revolution of dignity, 100 people died um, on the um, Square of Independence in Kiev. Then in March 2014, very quickly, as you can see, there was Crimea annexation by Russia. And then in August 2014, uh, the conflict in eastern Ukraine started. But it's not going to be the focus of, of um, today's discussion. Now, of course, the Western states condemned Putin's actions and then um, accused Russia in multiple breaches of international law, and we're going to discuss them uh, in the groups later. Article 2.4 of the United Nations, the one I showed before on the use of force, the Helsinki Accords, Budapest Memorandum, and Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation. And by the way, to what you were saying um, before about which one of them is binding and which one isn't, I think um, de jure, only the first one, is, is the binding one. And uh, Russia argued that the last three are not, and, and uh, they're actually correct in, in saying that. So I spoke to some of the professors at LSE asking about the possible justifications and looking at uh, Russia's case in the UN. Why, how could you possibly justify something like this, right? And Russia used two justifications, invitation by, um, sorry, intervention by invitation and Crimea's right to self-determination. So this was the UN um, assembly back in 2014 and that's the Russian ambassador holding a letter from ousted Ukrainian president. So he... Viktor Yanukovych went to Russia and sent Putin a letter asking Putin to enter Ukraine with troops and save Ukrainian people. Now, we still haven't seen that letter since then. We have never gotten a copy of a signed version of it. So he was throwing it around in the UN assembly and then they kind of lost it. So they haven't actually shown the evidence of this letter. So the question is, would this be a good enough justification? A president that is overthrown by a revolution um, asks the president of a foreign country to enter Ukraine with troops. What do you think? And sort of legally, common sense speaking, why, why yes, why no? Couldn't you tell them that for that, um, the whole question was to the government? 
Mm -hmm. But in my studied international community, I can make it more. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so this, this was Russia's claim. So what happened was the uh, Ukrainian interim government was very quickly recognized by the West. So they said that that government is the acting government in Ukraine. Uh, but of course, the Ukrainian president that fled said that that actually wasn't the case. I was the legitimate president and I asked Putin to enter the country with troops. And uh, there are really three reasons why um, this probably doesn't serve a good enough of a justification. One of them, there is strong case law that once you lose effective control uh, of the nation, you can, can no longer exercise your duties as leader of that nation on behalf of that nation. Um, as he um, was outvoted in parliament, he lost the support of the people, he left the country and moved to another state. You cannot argue that he, had, he didn't have effective control of armed forces, he didn't ha have effective control of his executive government. So he did not have effective control to invite Russia to intervene. There was also weakened claim of legitimacy because the revolution was exactly against that government that was corrupt and that really tricked the people, accepting a bribe from the Russian government. And last thing is that very, very obviously, Russia did not enter to re-establish the democratic regime in Ukraine, right? It intervened and also it happened so that then Crimea became part of Russia. This doesn't seem like a, like, a, like a proper justification for something like this because they were obviously acting in, as a matter of self-interest, not as a matter of restoring Ukrainians' democratic regime. Now, I myself believe that the second argument is a bit more convincing. Ukraine is very divided in the language. So the light yellow bits mostly speak Ukrainian. The green bits um, mostly speak Russian. You can see that Crimea and uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, where there is no conflict, are predominantly uh, Russian speaking and also are predominantly ethnically Russian. So every ethnicity, also case law is a bit difficult on that, but within the state has a right to self-determination. And we see that with uh, Scotland, we see that with Catalonia, uh, we see that to lesser extent uh, with some countries in Africa, for example, Nicaragua, uh, not in Africa, but that's okay. So if we think about this claim, this is really connected to Russia's arguments that Russian-speaking population in Ukraine was oppressed as a result of a nationalist government that came to power in Ukraine. Now, the UN Human Rights Commission found absolutely no evidence of any oppression to Russian-speaking um, people in Crimea. I'm myself a uh, Russian-speaking, I'm actually from over here, and uh, never in my life have I ever been oppressed or even heard of anyone being oppressed because you speak Russian. You know, language issue is a, is a very difficult one to bring up here because, for example, English is spoken by many countries. You know, UK doesn't go to the US and take New York because, well, you speak English. That doesn't make any sense. So there was a referendum. Uh, and in the referendum, Crimea overwhelmingly voted to join Russia. The referendum was not constitutional uh, according to the Ukrainian law. So, for example, referendum in Scotland. You, they submitted a request to the um, British Parliament. The Parliament approved it, and Scotland had a referendum. Same thing happened in Catalonia. With Crimea, it didn't happen. Referendum happened with a, a lot of the military oppression and military bases and personnel entering Crimea and possibly uh, exercising undue influence on the voters. So the referendum was not recognized. Also, there is plenty of evidence that the results were falsified. Uh, but not enough to say so determinately. Myself, personally, I think that given the difficult situation in Ukraine, Crimea could have voted to join Russia. But again, because the referendum was not constitutional, it's condemned by all the states apart from a few. So, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to say what the result would be, but we can say with surety that uh, it was not legal and it's not a legitimate exercise of will of Ukrainian people. Now, this all happened, um, you know, Ukraine is in devastation. Go ahead. Just a quick question, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. But I mean, if you just understand better, you said that you could imagine that the people of Crimea yeah. really uh, would have voted more than 50% Yeah. Russia. Yeah. So then the question is, is, the, um, the, is it legal that the ref 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 referendum, um, but I mean, then you could also argue of course. And maybe it's not a leader, but if they wanted to, they could join Russia and uh, so on. Yeah. It's so like a difficult question, like um, before, if um, the prime minister is no longer in the country, no longer has the, the, the 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that I absolutely agree. I think the problem with that is that it was the principle of territorial integrity is like at the core of international law. So the states are very, very, very stringent on the integrity of the state's territories. We don't want any other shuffling around. So the problem with this referendum was that, A, it was after the military invasion that there is enough, a lot of evidence of that. And also it was done in the dark, right? So we don't know what happened. Ukraine doesn't know, the rest of the world doesn't know. We, we don't, I'm speculating on how they would have voted because there was a situation of um, revolution in Ukraine. It could have seemed quite dangerous. Also, the, uh, the group that talks about hybrid warfare is going to talk about the propaganda in Crimea. So I think that, I think that if, for example, we allow this, something like that, because, well, we can say de facto, this is really what's happened. De facto, people of Crimea want to join Russia then in a second we're going to have a lot of different uh, self-determination claims popping up from all, all over the world. So I think, I, I agree with your point, but I think that, yeah, it, it, is, it is a matter of, of it being done openly, right? Like, for example, the Catalonia referendum, like that's super difficult, but it was, the whole world has seen what happened, right? In Crimea, nobody has seen what actually happened, so that we cannot say that people exercise their right freely. Yeah, I mean, the proper procedure is to restore the Crimean borders according to the Ukrainian constitution, for them to submit the referendum to the government as it's done in every other state, and then to have another referendum, right? That's, that's also the UK kind of topic. Another referendum, right? Why not? Uh, it seems that if it can be done, for example, in the UK, and there are talks about it being legitimate, then surely here uh, we've got to have another one. So I think now, after what happened, if Crimea is returned, to Ukraine, the Ukrainian government has no other option but to introduce another referendum with the, with the Western um, observers. Any other questions? Right, yeah, uh -huh. Marco? Yeah, that was actually what Russia was arguing, saying that, well, <coughs> Kosovo was a very, very difficult case. And uh, the court, the ICJ, as, you, as you're saying, they actually said that it was illegal, but le legitimate, which is like the most horrible thing you can do with a as a judge is to set a precedent that something is justifiable. It was illegal, but it was legitimate. So Kosovo is often brought up uh, as kind of a negotiation budge. Uh, by the Russian government saying, well, look what you did there, right? That was not constitutional. Kosovian people didn't submit their request to the Serbian parliament as, it, as they were supposed to do. So why is Crimea bad? And I think it's partially it's like two wrongs don't, don't make a right. Secondly, Russia condemned the actions of uh, the US and the West in the Kosovan case. So they cannot use the same justification because they're on the record for condemning that use of international law. Also, like, the legitimate part was because the Serbian government was reportedly uh, abusing the rights of the yeah. Soviet people. Yeah, Kosovar, I think. Kosovar, Kosovar. Yeah. yeah. While there was no reporting. Yeah, so, yeah. There was much more evidence to that effect. Yeah, so that's that. Now, the aftermath of unlawful use of force. Um, 10,000 people dead, 20,000 injured, and Putin is dancing with Austrian uh, Prime Minister, I believe, at her wedding. 
Then there was the Russia World Cup that uh, was actually, I mean, I, I watched it, I have to admit, it was, it was great, um, very exciting. Then there was the Olympics. So, you know, we can see that the West really let Russia do all these things. They, you know, in public, they condemned the actions of Putin, but they have no problem with inviting him to their residences. They have no problem with going off to work for Gazprom from their governments and things of that nature. So this is um, really what angered a lot of Ukrainians. It's the, 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 the idea of, you know, shaking hands with and, you know, smiling to and dancing with uh, someone who is so drenched in, um, in conflict, uncertainty and just, you know, murder, really. That's, um, that's questionable, right? So this is what, um, this is when we move on to the groups. So I decided to kind of think of seven lessons that us as a community can take from what happened in uh, Crimea, right? And these lessons are no longer legal, so this is it for the legal part. Uh, this is more about economics, politics, and um, geopolitics and things of that nature. So if you could take kind of five to 10 minutes to look at the information that you have on the printouts that you have on your tables, uh, discuss in groups, and then we come back and we go lesson by lesson and talk about the possible implications. Uh, let's go to the first group, nuclear disarmament prospects. Which one is that? Uh, Ukraine has do had the world's third large largest nuclear arsenal uh, that we have given up. And, um, you know, Russia was one of the main guarantors of our territorial sovereignty, which is uh, ironic in a bad way. So do you think that Ukraine would have benefited from its nuclear arsenal if, for example, we had it? I think it would probably be more of a deterrence thing rather than, I don't, like, to what you were saying, I don't think you would press the button really, but I think probably Russia could have acted differently if Ukraine was still a nuclear nation. Uh, right, let's move on to group two, economic sanctions. Um, you know, also the Russian elite is not too bothered about the economic well-being of the Russia has very low GDP per capita, very low real income. So, you know, for them, it's, it's, a, it's an ideology matter. You know, Russian people are living worse than they did before, but Putin's um, rankings are as high as they have ever been. So, yeah, exactly, exactly that. Sanctions might not be the best tool. Uh, domestic turbulence. So it's really, really a matter of timing of, of all of those things happening to Western democracies, exactly depriving them of that political capital and of... Um, the trust that the voter has in those, in those governments to be more affirmative kind of on the world stage. You know, I have a funny feeling that if, if it was Reagan, Thatcher, and I don't know, De Gaulle, there would be a different conversation going on than it is with the current leaders. Uh, UN security veto powers. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. Just, just for your own kind of knowledge, there is actually Article 27, uh, Para 3, saying that a party to the dispute should actually abstain from voting. Uh, but that hasn't been invoked by any member for uh, decades now. So even in the conflict that is that straightforward, where obviously Russia has some sort of an involvement, you know, to say the least, it's not just that it wasn't accepted. None of the uh, members of the Security Council invoked Article 27, Part 3. Why do you think that is? Uh, they have an ongoing understanding that they would never do that. They wouldn't, they wouldn't. Uh, well, it, it, it doesn't have the retrospective power, but they, um, the reality is that there are areas of geopolitical influence and uh, Ukraine is in area of Russian geopolitical influence. So unless US is on par with China and they come together against Russia, they wouldn't invoke something like this. And that is a difficult prospect to kind of entertain. Um, right, uh, hybrid warfare. That, go, that goes back to the first talk of today with the autonomous weapons and things of that nature. You know, that, that is very likely to go into this gray area of hybrid warfare, like nearly patented by Russia now. So the usual laws of war don't really apply in the same way, exactly because Russia has been saying they're not in Crimea until it became part of Russian Federation. And then they're like, okay, maybe we were, maybe we weren't. So yeah, exactly that. It's, it's, it's very difficult, especially with uh, states that deploy a lot of money for something like media propaganda, something like church propaganda and, and things of that nature. Uh, right, lesson six, gas. Uh, yep. I think with, with gas, it's um, actually in the UK, there is very little uh, Russian gas, so, so we can all sleep calmly at night. 
Uh, but yeah, Russian gas is very cheap. Russian gas is very convenient uh, to get in Europe. So giving up the gas, especially for Germany, is going to be very detrimental economically. And actually, Trump, a few days ago, I think, called out Germany for being a, a puppet of Russia because of the gas, maybe, maybe a few weeks ago, something like this. So with this Nord Stream 2, this is going to be a conversation in months moving forward. All right. Oh, sorry. Oops. Last lesson. Uh, trading with the enemy. Oh, you, you're so lonely there. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Went to trade with the enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it would be desirable if this, the trade profits actually went to the pockets of Ukrainian people and not to the pockets of Ukrainian government. Uh, but that's, that's another matter. The truth is that, yeah, Ukraine is very split on that because Russia is a, a massive partner of ours. But also, you know, saying that Russia is invading us and Russia is the aggressor, but they're also our biggest export and import partner. That makes very little sense. And this is also what's playing against Ukraine in the geopolitical game. So I think this, this, is, um, this is really down to the Ukrainian government to kind of have a, have a clear uh, stance on this. But yeah, you're absolutely right. For example, in, uh, in 19th century, in 18th century, it was perfectly OK to trade uh, while you're at war. Yeah, but it, was, it used to be the aristocracy that goes to war, and then the government's trade is perfectly fine if there is a territorial dispute, for example. So things have changed. Uh, all right, so guys, if you want to get in touch, these are my social channels. This is my email if you have any questions. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate your participation. You're all super smart and uh, have a great summit and, and all that. Thank you.